back in about 1941, we're going to go back there, when you received a letter from from the Queen. The Queen? Yes. I'd like to pay a tribute to the ladies that contributed to this letter. It was during the war, of course, and we had this active uh, patriotic fund at Lower Portland, and the lady friends of mine down there, I'd like to name some of them, but I perhaps I'd better not, they were all noted for their beautiful knitting, hand knitting. And I heard an appeal on the air from London by Princess Elizabeth, who was very active then in war work, appealing for baby clothes for the bombed out babies, the victims of London. I suggested to my lady friends that they set to work with their needles, which they did willingly, and we packed off to Princess Elizabeth a large carton of exquisitely knitted garments, all trimmed with little French roses, and the letter came back uh, at the command of the Queen. When the war started, there was uh, a lot of recruiting, and quite a number of um, people in from along Anna Grove Road. The younger people joined the forces, some in all different uh, areas of the um, of the armed forces. But as in Annan Grove itself, as the war pro progressed, uh, we weren't allowed in the bush at certain times. We couldn't go down into the and do our normal playing and fishing. Uh, the army took it over and used it as uh, army manoeuvres and uh, mock battles and that sort of thing in the war. And uh, the Air Force, pretty well every day, you'd see you could, there were mock uh, battles and dogfights uh, in the air with all the different aircraft uh, training to um, before they went to war. And then the army um, often had route marches through Annengrove and the soldiers would march through down the road and uh, we had rationing and didn't have too many clothes and, you, and all the blacks that smoked had to put up with about two ounces a week of cigarettes <laughs> or tobacco. Um, do you remember Dad making up headlight, little headlight um, covers so that you could only... Uh, it was like a candlelight in front of you as you drove along, you know, and, and you had to paint a white line on your mudguards so that you could be seen in the dark if the light happened to light, uh, shine on your car. We, we lost our postman who was called up. We lost other individuals, young men uh, that we knew by name and enjoyed their company and meeting them socially. It had an effect upon the families. The news on the radio, such as the radios were, was never very pleasant, and they they gave reports which we associated with some of our members in that division and that battalion. We put brown paper over our windows to stop our light from from uh, falling to the outside and to collectively having the village bombed for some reason or other. We uh, we also responded to the siren of all things, which was on a huge pole at the top of uh, the Rogan's Hill area. And that that was uh, never pleasant. When it went off, we all went white and wondered what was going to happen. And so to, to, to assist us in our build of confidence, the, the school authorities required open trenches to be dug at the bottom end of the school paddock uh, and uh, that was quite a, an undertaking. There were no such things as backhoes. The, it was all shovel and pick. And we could hear the explosions when the Japanese uh, came inside the heads and, uh, and took out several of our ships and a number of our personnel. So we, we also knew that they were standing off the coast There was an army camp on the showground. 
the transport was up and down Showground Road and my mother organised with a couple of friends that uh, and cleared it with the uh, commander of the camp uh, that we should go down there one afternoon a week and uh, in school holidays I was able to go and we sewed stripes or colour patches on the uniforms, we darned socks, we darned um, knees of uniforms. We would walk down and sit on the veranda uh, at an army table and we were always given scones and a cup of tea uh, for afternoon tea and then if there happened to be a vehicle uh, going somewhere in the afternoon we would get a ride home. The church in order to provide some amenities for the soldiers had a club in the church hall uh, three nights a week Monday, Wednesday and Friday and there were uh, such things as bobs which is a f sort of form of snooker uh, coits table tennis and there was sing-song around the piano there. My mother could supply butter to the other ladies to make cakes so we always had supper afterwards. Uh, somebody had to surrender their coupons for the tea and the sugar. Yes, wartime was with us all the time and of course uh, the, uh, the youth of the area coming home on leave, uh, it was all uniform. From 9 till 15, you live with the war every day. Uh, the air raid sirens were going off, the ARP wardens were coming round and blackout practice. Uh, the, the women were in Red Cross, the girls were in Red Cross. I got into the uh, school cadets. Uh, the uh, people who stopped behind, the uh, male members of the district, uh, if they were World War II, uh, one, uh, they formed the, uh, the uh, Volunteer Defence Corps and Mr Cattell, who was a World War One digger, uh, he uh, used to uh, drill all the old diggers in the, in the school grounds. Uh, then, of course, uh, the army moved into the showground at Castle Hill in uh, early 42 to about 44 and then... Uh, the Army took over Masonic Schools Hospital as the 103rd Australian General Hospital and that eventually became a 1,200-bed uh, orthopaedic ward uh, and with RAF Richmond being so close, uh, we reckon we could uh, nearly hit a, uh, a Wirraway or an Avro Anson uh, coming in to land at uh, Richmond with a catapult, but we never ever tried. Now, can you describe um, your typical day at the hospital as a VAD? Well, we were woken up by Ravelli every morning at 6 o'clock and you'd fly out of bed. And you'd... It wasn't so bad in the summertime because you could run out in pyjamas. We started at 8 o'clock in the morning. You'd come back to your own mess to have your lunch. Then you went back to work, back in the ward, and you would probably work there till 6 o'clock. The... Evenings, if you were rostered onto the night shift, that was the very, very hard one because you were on duty from 7 o'clock at night until 7 o'clock in the morning. How many qualified nursing sisters would there have been? Oh, there was quite a big staff of nursing sisters there. There probably would have been about 50 or 60. At different times, the doctors would come in for relief, you see. I couldn't tell you exactly how many. There would have, probably would have been about four, four or five there permanent. What did the soldiers that came in mainly suffer from? What? If they came back from New Guinea or things like that and they had malaria, sometimes they would be brought out to us because we had the malaria ward there. There were a lot of, a lot of men there that came with leg problems and arm problems and they did a lot of surgery and physiotherapy on them. I was a member of the CYO in Parramatta and the priest used to take us out to the 103rd AGH military hospital at Masonic Schools because there were 
there were soldiers in there from all over Australia. So we used to go out once a month, and if anyone wanted a letter written home, we would do it for them. And on this particular night or evening, I was writing a letter for a young soldier who came from South Australia. And in the next bed was this other wounded soldier. One thing led to another. And, but he was up there for a, a couple of years because by the time that the legs start to heal, he was on in, on crutches, on calipers, on, you know, all sorts of things to get walking again. When he was discharged from the army, he came straight to work for my dad, driving the truck. The woolen mills where you worked in during the war, what sort of operation was it? It was a very big operation. They were making the, the grey military blankets. I used to do the wages. There was perhaps two or three hundred employees working in the mill. Because Dad had market garden, it was classed as number one priority. So I had to get a special uh, dispensation from the labour department to go and work at the mill. Now, your father being an Italian, and, and uh, when the Second World War came along, many Italians were interned because they were deemed to be a, uh, a yes. security risk. Uh, was your father, did he suffer the same fate? Almost, but he never quite got interned. We had a, a, a neighbour who was not kind to us next door, and he tried to get him interned. They used to have what they call a flying squad those days, and they came up and they went around the district and Dad was, I think he was an extremely good man. And uh, the people seen it that way and they did take his rifle off to it, off him, his twenty two uh, rifle. Uh, why I remember quite distinctly that part of it was that I went, after the war finished, I went up with a horse and sulky with him and I've never seen a cell before, never seen one since either, I'm happy to say. But I seen this cell, and there was the lone rifle in the corner, and the sergeant went and got it and gave it to us, and we come home with the horse and sulky. That must have been in 1945. 